station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. I am ready for the event. Sky Sports, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Simon Lazenby. How do you hear me? Hey, Simon, thanks for calling in today. I got you loud and clear. That's fantastic. Uh, Commander Foistel, thank you so much for joining us uh, here on Sky Sports F1. As you can see, we're in our, our control room here. Uh, first of all, how's the view up there? Well, well, as, as you may have seen from some of my photos uh, of Earth, the view is pretty fantastic. It never gets old. We see 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. And I like to think of looking at the planet like staring at a campfire. You really, uh, really never want to look away. The, the view is just spe spectacular. We were really interested to speak to you because we know you're a bit of a, a motorsport fan. I saw you uh, talking in the press conference to the Moto Chief GP guys. Um, but we also know that you're a big fan of Formula One. Uh, when did you first get interested? Well, it, that's a good point, Simon. I have been a fan of motorsports my whole life. I grew up in Detroit, and you may know that's uh, referred to as the Motor City. So as a, as a kid, I was racing motocross when I was pretty young and then eventually got into racing bicycles and um, finally go-karts for about seven years. And then my kids great, uh, raced go-karts uh, when they were old enough to drive. So we've been into motorsports for a long time. I started restoring cars when I was 14. It's always been a part of my life. So I've always just uh, enjoyed watching races and always had a dream really to, uh, to be a race car driver. I had two, two goals in life, was either to be a Formula One racer or an astronaut, and I, I feel lucky that I was able to achieve uh, one of my main goals and very fortunate to have had this opportunity. But at one time, I thought about uh, being a race car driver as well. So you're pretty good then. You've always felt the need for speed. I definitely have a need for speed. I don't know how good I am at it, but uh, I like to have fun and uh, I like to go fast and uh, especially in controlled environments where it's safe and that's that's sort of the key, especially for uh, racing and I would always say you know, don't try going at fa going fast at home, especially out on public roads, but uh, race tracks are a great place to, to give that a try where everybody else has got the same goal, which is staying on the track, keeping everything in one piece and making it to the finish line. Tell me, we've got eight races to go, and we've got a, a fantastic battle between the top two drivers at the moment in Lewis Hamilton and, and Sebastian Vettel. Have you been able to follow the Formula One season from up there in space? Absolutely. I have been watching every single race from space uh, live as it's happened. We do have some calm gaps, which means there'll be occasions when I'll miss uh, five or ten minutes of the race, and I'm always looking forward to seeing what's happened after the uh, after we get the comm coverage back but i've been able to watch every race my first photo uh, my first track photo from space was the first race of the season in australia and what was really spectacular about that picture was i i had envisioned this idea of taking photos of the f1 season the 2018 season and that first race was i think it was the 26th of march if i recall that sunday and that day was the first time I had tried to take a photo of a track from space. And I actually got that photo, my first uh, photo on social media of a racetrack, was the uh, track in uh, Melbourne. Um, and I took the photo within two minutes of the start of the race, which means not only did I have to be directly overhead, but it had to be a cloudless day, which it was, nice and sunny, and the timing was just right for the start of the race. So starting from that moment on, I've been not only photographing the races, but also taking pictures of the circuits, or uh, but watching the races uh, each, each weekend as they come along. I typically, occasionally I'll pick up practice on Fridays. Uh, I always try to catch uh, qualifying 
on Saturday and then the race as well uh, when Sunday uh, shows up is, is a great, great time up here for me because it's a time to relax and enjoy something that I used to enjoy uh, or still, you know, will eventually again enjoy back on the planet. Oh, that's great stuff. I mean, we'd love to invite you. Uh, to, to, I don't know if you're back down in time for the Circuit of the Americas and, and the Austin Grand Prix. Have you been to any races live in the past, Formula One races live in the past? And, yeah, would you accept that invitation if you're down in time? I think it's October the 21st. Yeah, actually it is, and I am planning to, uh, to be there. I will be home. Hopefully I'll be stable and walking in a straight line by then. But uh, I've seen uh, races. I saw the very first race at COTA. Uh, back in, I think it was, was it 2012? And uh, I've seen several races in Montreal, at the track in Montreal, and last year was fortunate to see the race at Silverstone, the Silverstone F1 in uh, 2017. So I've been to a handful of races, and I really enjoy it every time. There's nothing like seeing a race live in person. I say the same thing about seeing rockets launch. There's nothing like seeing a rocket launch live and in person. It's, it's really nothing the, like the way that it seems on television. It's clearly much more dramatic and, uh, and has a, a greater impression on you. And I think the same thing is true of watching a Formula One race live. There's nothing quite like that sound and, and witnessing that speed as, uh, as the drivers come by and uh, make their way around the circuit. It's just amazing. Oh, you'll definitely have to swing by and uh, or stop by and, and, and see you at uh, Sky Sports F1 when you come down for that. We'll look forward to that. We really will, uh, Commander Drew. Uh, just tell us, though, if you could, a few comparisons between what you do for a living and what the F1 drivers do. We know they're used to pulling huge amount of G-force. Uh, what's the amount of G-force that you pull when you take off, lift off? Well, believe it or not, we really max out at about uh, three Gs. Well, at least in the space shuttle, we used to max out at three Gs. Um, the Soyuz rocket is a, a little bit more than that, but it's not too much of a G load. And really, what we feel is just a constant acceleration as we're as we're launching off into space, and that has to do with obviously the thrust to weight ratio of, of the spacecraft that we use. So the G-loads aren't that great. It's, it's a lot less than what a, a military pilot or uh, someone in a high-performance aircraft or jet uh, would experience uh, when they're maneuvering their aircraft. The difference is we feel our G-loads through our chest, whereas in an airplane you sort of feel them uh, through your spine from your head to your toes. Uh, race car drivers also feel those G-loads in their chest, both uh, as they're accelerating and decelerating. And also, of course, they feel the lateral G-loads when they're uh, turning, you know, making the corners. We don't have any of those lateral G loads, uh, except on re entry, we do experience some of that as the capsule starts to slow down and uh, when the parachute comes out, as the capsule bounces around, headed back towards the planet. Uh, and we do on re entry experience G loads that are actually higher than what we experience on launch, and we can get up upwards of four to eight G's, or sorry, four to four to five G's on re entry, sometimes a little bit higher. Um, and then landing, of course, is a very abrupt, uh, immediate G-load, which is similar to what would happen if you crashed a, a vehicle, uh, not only a race car, but just about anything. So, so we have a varying, varying ranges of G-loads, but on launch, it's really not that great. It's uh, three or a bit more than that on the way to, on the way to space. Are you trained to cope? I'm interested to see with the, the adrenaline rush that you must get when you lift off and when you, you know, re-enter the atmosphere, because we know that Formula One drivers, that's what they live off. They just love the rush. Um, but you seem to be in a very controlled environment inside the space station. I should imagine that's bookended by uh, exhilaration. Well, certainly on launch, there's uh, quite a bit of excitement, and we really don't have anything to prepare us for a launch except the stories that we hear from other astronauts that have flown before us. That's, I guess that's how you mentally prepare, just listening to what it's going to be like and what to expect. The moment of, I, I, I like to say that for my first launch, for me it was the fear of the unknown. I just didn't know what to expect, and, and on the space shuttle it's pretty pretty exciting, invigorating, and somewhat violent experience as you launch up into space. The second time I launched on the space shuttle, 
I refer to it as the fear of the known because I knew exactly what was going to happen and what it was going to feel like, which was again exciting, exhilarating, and a little bit terrifying at times. And then uh, Soyuz, uh, the, the Russian rocket that I launched on most recently, is entirely different. It's a bit smoother. What I noticed the most about it was it had a very unique sound to it, uh, sort of like a, a grinding, a, a growling or grinding engine just or a buzzsaw just buzzing away all the way to space. And that was amazing to me because it's totally different than the shuttle. And also the capsule is so much smaller that you're really packed in. But the moment of liftoff is quite exciting, as I imagine is the moment of the, the start of a race, for example, uh, once you start heading towards that, that first corner. and. I know when I'm watching, that's always the most uh, anticipated moment, and really it's that first turn to see if everybody's going to make it through that first turn. And I remember the same being the case when I used to race motocross. It's like everybody takes off from that big, broad starting line and next down to just a little, that first turn that's just a few bikes wide, and, and you're just hoping that you're going to get through and make it out. And I, and I see the same things happening every time we get the start of an F1 race. But uh, the excitement's there, I think, uh, for us. It's difficult to prepare until you've done it, but it is just an amazing ride. And, and I always tell my wife that no matter what happens, I'm smiling from ear to ear because this is uh, really what we, we live to do, just like the drivers live to race. I'm not sure if you saw the start of the race at Spa last weekend, but there was an incident, as you said, at the first quarter, a dramatic incident where we saw Fernando Alonso's car launched over the top of Charles Leclerc, and the halo, a safety device, uh, actually it looked like it really did its job, um, and thankfully everyone was okay. I don't know how many dangerous situations you've encountered during your time in space. I know you've been on a veteran of a few spacewalks, but if you were to have to extricate a, a driver, let's say, uh, I've seen that process happen, and, and, and that's a fairly complex one, but if anyone was injured in space, how would you get them back down to Earth? How would you deal with that sort of situation? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to comment on the, the first point you made about uh, uh, Alonzo and uh, Leclerc at the beginning of that race. It was amazing to see that halo do what it was supposed to do. I can't imagine, I, I hope we don't ever have to imagine again what, what it would be like without those. And uh, it's really impressive the way that that thing held up to the stresses. Uh, really, uh, uh, really speaks to the engineering effort that went involved and in, uh, was involved in developing that. And uh, hats off to everybody who who brought that into uh, into production and got those on the vehicles because clearly that's an important step towards safety for the drivers. Uh, for us, we try to plan for all contingencies if we can. Uh, we have our spacecraft, our Soyuz spacecraft that we fly that we fly into space. So there's six crew members on board. Uh, each set of three crew members has their own Soyuz. And if we had a critical medical emergency, we can be off the spacecraft and on the ground in about three hours, maybe less, if we're really working fast. And that would allow us to seek medical attention, provided that we uh, left the space station at, at the right time so that we landed in the right spot on the planet. So there's some variations as to when you would actually or where you would land on Earth when you when you deorbited. Uh, but for a, a medical emergency, hopefully we would be able to stabilize the crew member uh, to give us the right to allow us the right timing to undock from the space station and burn the engines on the Soyuz spacecraft so that we land in the right spot in order to, to seek medical attention. But we do have plans in place. We have some very basic life-saving equipment on the space station, including AEDs and the ability to uh, you, you, um, install tracheotomy tubes, things like that, uh, or trach tubes, and we have oxygen supply, a lot of medications that we can use, and of course the support from Mission Control, who's always there. We always have a flight surgeon uh, on board on console, or on console that we can talk to uh, about any medical emergencies we have and to, in order to help lead us through uh, taking care of a patient and stabilizing them if we need to for you know, possibly returning to Earth if it came to that. Okay, from one serious question to a, a slightly less serious one. Uh, one member of our team, Johnny Herbert, it was known uh, that he couldn't get to the end of the race without needing the bathroom uh, once. So, unfortunately, uh, his engineers came to find a bit of a damp cockpit 
at the end of it. He couldn't hold it in. Uh, and this, I suppose, <laughs> goes hand in hand with a question from my son, who's a young lad. He's got an inquisitive mind. Uh, you know, how do you hold it off and how does the bathroom tend to work in space or on the space station? Well, fortunately, we do have a bathroom on orbit. We have two bathrooms for six people, which is fantastic because sometimes, you know, there's, on occasion there can be lineups there. Uh, when we go out to do a spacewalk, of course, we're out in that suit. Uh, we're in that suit for probably eight hours, sometimes up to ten hours by the time we're done after, after we first put it on. So we actually wear diapers in the spacesuit uh, just for that purpose, uh, to make sure that we don't have to... Um, soil the suit, so to speak, or give ourselves, uh, you know, make the suit a little bit wet on the inside. But the good news is also that the air is fairly dry inside those spacesuits. So if you were to uh, have an accident, the the system that's, uh, the, air, the air supply system that's in there would probably dry it out by the time you actually got out of the spacesuit. But we do plan for those contingencies as well. Same thing is true when we launch and re-enter uh, in the spacecraft, we wear we wear diapers so that uh, you know when you got to go, you got to go. There have been I know drivers in the past, as you mentioned, that uh, couldn't quite hold it and end up, as you said, with a wet wet uh, wet driving suit and probably a wet seat. There we go, adult nappies, who'd have thought it? Uh, also, I'm not sure I could go an entire week uh, without an Indian meal, a chicken vindaloo. Um, what do you miss? What, what foodstuffs do you miss the most up there in space? Yeah, well, some vindaloo sounds fantastic right about now. We don't have any of that, although I do have a few items of uh, Indian flavor. I have some Indian curry and some uh, chicken korma and things like that. We, one of the crew members has some butter chicken, so all of that sounds like some, some great food to me right now, especially uh, because my father-in-law is actually from Delhi, so we've enjoyed a lot of Indian food. I'm, I'm not surprised you brought uh, Indian food up, but uh, we have good food up here on orbit. Um, after a period of six months, you start to see, well, if, even after a few weeks, you start to see some repetition in what we eat. At this point in my flight, because I'm only five weeks, hopefully, from uh, heading home, I've stopped worrying about the fact that I'm eating the same foods over and over, because uh, it, it can get a little bit redundant. But it's, it's funny that up here, when we eat, for example, if I eat cereal every morning for breakfast up here, I somehow feel like... Um, I'm not getting the food that I want, that I wish I could do something different for breakfast every day. But the fact is that back on Earth, when I'm home, I literally eat cereal every day for breakfast. And not only is it cereal, but it's the same cereal. Whereas up here, I seem to want to have different cereals uh, every breakfast meal, and I don't always get that. So I don't know why, psychologically, it seems different that we don't get the variety that maybe we wish for, but back on Earth, I'm not sure we get a whole lot more variety anyways. But we do okay with the food. Uh, we're able to maintain our body mass, which is important. And, um, and sometimes we barter food with the other international partners. I like trading with uh, my uh, crewmate, Alex Gers from Germany. He's got some great special food that was flown up for him. The Russians have really good food as well, and they like some of ours, so we do some bartering occasionally with them as well to uh, you know, expand the, uh, the palate a little bit and give us more variety for our meals. But no, no beer or vodka on the space station, obviously. Um, just tell me, if you could, before you go, the highlight of your time and the best part of being uh, an astronaut. You know, that's a difficult question to ask. For me, um, I've been at this job for 18 years. I absolutely love what I do. I couldn't be luckier, and I, and I know every day that I'm fortunate to have these opportunities, and I know all astronauts feel that way. Um, we've reached a goal in our life that we set for ourselves, some of us very early on in life. I always believed I would have an opportunity to work in space and the space program. And I think now, um, for me, the highlight is sharing the stories, having opportunities to tell people like you. Um, the folks that follow racing that may not really ever think about space or the space program, to reach out to young, to kids, talk about their dreams, try to inspire them. 
I think I've transitioned from being a kid, although I still like to be a kid, to being a, hopefully a mentor and someone that can inspire younger generations. I was inspired as a kid by the people that I looked up to and, and the people that I saw doing the things I wanted to do, those who had principles and integrity and really believed in their work. And I believe in the work I'm doing, and I believe it's the key to the future of humans. And I hope that I can be an inspiration with the things I do. And that's what the highlight is for me, is sharing the stories of our work, getting people excited, uh, not only young kids, but actually older, older kids too, like adults, people that really never thought to or have had the chance to ask an astronaut what's it like in space and really put their mind there and think about those things and imagine the wonder of it and and then sort of get involved and start to support it and and understand a bigger picture a bigger global picture on how we all relate to each other and how important it is for all of us to work together on this spaceship that we call earth that's hurtling through space right now I can tell you uh, this adult feels like a, a child right now. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor to speak to you. My first ever spaceman, Commander Forrestal. So uh, thank you so much for sparing your time. And, and please do come and see us at Sky Sports F1 if you make it to the Circuit of the Americas. Top man, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I'll, uh, I'll be looking out for you in, uh, in Austin, and I'm sure we can meet up. But thanks for taking the time to reach out and uh, giving an opportunity for all your viewers to join us on the space station and talk a little bit about what we're doing and what inspires us and what we enjoy. And I hope we can do the same for you. So for everybody out there, all the F1 fans, I hope you enjoy the next race. I'll be watching right along with you. Take care, Simon. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, Sky Sports and participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.